official uh, checks that we have sound and everything. Every week we have a technical issue and fingers crossed this week we managed to iron that out in the backstage within the five, ten minutes. And it's always great when a guest jumps on a little bit early so we can iron through those creases. So I'll just wait for everybody to jump on board and then hopefully we'll see uh, where we're at. There we go. We've got our first comment. Natasha Stanley says, good evening. Uh, Natasha, if you can hear me okay, let me know. If not, then uh, we will figure it out as we go along. You're all good. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Natasha. Uh, so each week we bring you an expert stage hypnotist. And tonight, uh, I think I think he's a level up from expert. I think it's fair to say this guy is legendary within the hypnosis community. Um, he's got some amazing stories uh, and does and does everything and does everything really well. Uh, I read uh, a great book from this guy a few years ago on forensic hypnosis, uh, which was fascinating. And he was one of the very first people that I kind of saw that brought the science into hypnosis using the EEG machine so you can physically see this. Uh, he is an absolutely amazing powerhouse when it comes to knowledge on stage hypnosis, hypnotherapy, performing hypnosis, and the science behind that as well. So I hope you've all got your questions ready. Because guys, this is so important. These talks are a great opportunity for you to kind of pick the brains and get advice and get, you know, ask the questions of the true pioneers within the hypnosis industry. And tonight's guest is a true pioneer in the hypnosis industry. So I'm going to play my usual little graphic. Then after that, I want you to please make him feel very welcome. We have the one and only Tom Silver. He should appear, I think it's going to be that side, any second now. There he is. There he is. I can there see it. There he is. Uh, oh, wow. we've got a, a few hellos as well. Natasha Stanley says, really excited for tonight. Uh, this guy must have some unbelievable stories. Roy Miller uh, says, good evening. And Susie Lawrence says, hi. Uh, Roy Miller says, legend. Jeff Benink from the Netherlands uh, says, hi, Tom and Tom and Grant and the crowd. Uh, nice. So, yes, a fantastic welcome there. Uh, so, oh, first cool. and foremost, uh, whereabouts are you in the world at the moment, and is it warm? Well, it is warm. I live in Medford, Oregon, southern Oregon, uh, on the west coast, and it's hot. It's probably going to be about 100 degrees outside. Nice. I live on a 40-acre forest and mountains, so my only neighbors are, are um, um, animals, people that have uh, animals that have four legs. <laughs> and it's great. It's great to be here. It's great to be on your show. I've been looking forward to being on this and and hopefully talking about some cool stuff in hypnotism and answering some questions and, and giving you the real deal. I've always been a big believer in honesty, um, in ethics, and being who you are. Not pretending to be somebody else, but embracing who you are. Because really, you're the best, you're the best uh, representative, representative of yourself and and hypnotism and uh Absolutely. you know i love hypnosis and I, and thank you so much for having me on today it's it's weird and it's uh, I'm, I'm sure you know this already but you know the, the people that i've spoke to over this series the people that have been you know that are really at the top of their game all kind of share that same thing they still have passion about hypnosis it's their love and they're just looking to make a, a, a an income from it uh natasha stanley says i like you already <laughs> Um, Rob, <laughs> Rob Camps says, uh, hello, Tom. Awesome to see you here. Hey, Rob. Uh, John McCabe says, hi. Uh, my, um, there we go. Yes. We, oh, J Jason Nobby Morgan says, hello as well. Uh, so yeah, we've got, we've got nice. hypnotist tuning in from around the world to speak to you. Um, your profile picture, the one that I used for the thumbnail for this, uh, image is, I love it. It's, it's now hypnotists do poses like that as a throwback to the original poses, but that's that's the original pose as such. Um, so tell me about your first experience with hypnosis. When did you first encounter your first hypnotist? Well, you know, that's a, that's a great question. You know, um, for many years, I was always interested in 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 philosophies and spirituality and psychics and mediums and all of that stuff. And as a kid, I used to dabble a little bit in hypnosis, but not too much. 
But my first experience in hypnosis actually came in between gigs working in, in the record industry. I was actually a marketing uh, director in two major record labels. And for many years, I was a musician. I played saxes. I still do saxophones, flutes, and played in all kinds of bands in Hollywood, and just really all over the place. And during the really golden age of music, actually, in the uh, 19, late 60s and 70s. But anyway, I was in between record gigs. And hey, Robin, glad. Oh, great. Thank you. Coming to my course here in the Netherlands. Um, I, my brother told me there was an opening for a camera guy at a hypnotism school. And, he sa and I said, all of a sudden, when he did that, man, my, the light bulbs flashed off. I go, wow, I get to be a cameraman and earn $10 an hour credit to be able to go through this big hypnotism school. It was in Southern California. It's called the Hypnosis Motivation Institute. Now they call it HMI, like KFC, Kentucky Fried Chicken, <laughs> it's all initials, you know, Neuro Linguistic Programming, NLP. So anyway, I, I was the main camera guy on stage videotaping these <clears throat> lifelong hypnotists, these guys teaching the courses in the school <clears throat> and doing what we call actual case histories. And that's, oh, clarinet, excellent, Natasha. We'll do a duet one day. So um, I was recording these, these guys and gals, these ladies, people that were living in the field of hypnotism 20, 30, 40 years as hypnotherapists. And as I was looking through it, my passion, my desire, my excitement towards hypnosis kept increasing. I kept like seeing the possibilities of how fantastic this science is. So after a year of being the camera guy, earning $10 an hour credit, I was able to go through the course. It was a full year course. So it wasn't a, a two day accelerated hypnotherapy course. It was a full year of training in what I might call basic hypnotism. And then I went into a residency program, meaning I was working at the clinic, seeing people doing hypnotherapy, but I always loved stage hypnosis. Yeah. So during this time, I picked up these old videos of all these really cool stage hypnotists. I remember picking up a video of an older, older cat named Orman McGill. Now, I didn't know Orman was still alive. Um, here's a picture of me and Orman on my first book, The How-To Book of Hypnotism. I'm not promoting no. this book. It's not for sale. But there's <laughs> Orman McGill. So um, I, I started watching people doing these hypnosis techniques, inductions. There was a guy named Sam Vine from Canada. And I was watching Sam's shows and all this stuff. And so I thought, man, I want to be a stage hypnotist. You know, I mean, I love hypnotherapy, but I yeah. want to do it all. I just don't yeah. want to be a hypnotherapist. I didn't want to just be a stage hypnotist. I wanted to do it all. So I started practicing and, and I'm practicing on empty chairs. I'm creating routines, openings, the bits I'm going to do, uh, how I'm going to end the show. And I'm pretending that that in these chairs and on the couch in my living room were people. So I was pretending and going through it. And um, and then I had my first show. I got to tell you about this. You got a second? Oh, absolutely. OK, so I booked my first show. And now this first show is a birthday party for a guy. And um, it, it was at his home, a house party, a house hypnotism party. So I booked this show and and I don't even know what I charged. Maybe I charged 100 bucks. I just wanted to get out there and do it. I didn't really care about the money. I wanted to have the experience of, of, of being in the field, man, being in the front. So I, I drive up to this guy's house. His name was Al Ungerman. I, I still have a video of my first hypnotism show back in like 1986 or something like that. So I drive up. Now, my wife was my sound assistant, my ex-wife. So I taught her <laughs> how to do yeah, the music and sound effects. We were using audio cassettes, man. Wow. I had a box. I had a box of 60 audio cassettes. Each one had a different routine on it. So can you imagine doing a demonstration and then going to and the second routine and having to find the seat, the cassette and put it in and, and make sure she's ready to push the button when I count to three. <laughs> so I get there, we roll up and I look and the windows open and there are all these people at this party, birthday party for this guy. I look at my, my ex-wife and I say, hey, I said, I can't go out there. I can't, I can't go out. I'm not going to do it. I got scared. I thought, fail, fail, fail. It's not going to work. You know, I mean, I wasn't really 
sure about the power of hypnotism. Now I'm beyond sure about the power of hypnosis. But I, I kept saying, I'm not going to do it. Let's just go home. I started sweating. I got this performance anxiety. Yeah. So she gets in a fight with me. She starts screaming at me and yelling at me. You know, we packed everything up. You've practiced. You've got your things. Get out there. So she actually literally threw me out of the car. And, I, and, you know, and I'm like walking into this house party, all these relatives and friends. I'm this stranger guy walking in to do my first hypnotism stage show. I was scared out of my wits, man. Yeah. So I walk in. Now, in those, I'm setting up my little sound system, my little speakers. And um, then, and then my ex-wife, Renee, she was behind the stage with her audio cassettes. And so then I start the thing. I start my, my opening. But, you know, as I start my opening, I got into a zone, man. As soon as I started my opening, it's almost like I transformed from this scared guy, afraid to go in there and, and thinking doom and gloom and failure and all this stuff. And all of a sudden I got into, into my personality as a stage hypnotist. And I, and I wound up doing this show and it was fantastic. It was the most extraordinary thing I ever did in my life. I mean, if you've ever taken drugs, this is way beyond drugs. This is way <laughs> yeah. beyond a roller coaster ride at Disneyland. I mean, there was one lady I did the, in the, those days. We did certain bits that you just don't do anymore. I mean, I can get into some weird bits that were OK now. Now they're socially unacceptable. Um, yeah. Yeah. But um, I'll never forget. I, I did the naked audience thing. So I said, you know, people on the count of three, you'll open your eyes. There's a naked audience out there. Everyone's naked. So, you know, they open their eyes and they're laughing and, and all this stuff. And some someone on stage said he saw a tattoo on this lady's shoulder. She He actually saw this tattoo. So at the end of the show, we went up to this lady and we asked her if she had a tattoo that it, it, uh, on these shoulders, you know, and um, she did. She had, oh, wow. This guy actually saw a tattoo this lady had, and he never knew the lady before. I mean, ooh, I don't know where yeah. it came from, but it was wild. Anyway, it was the most exciting thing I'd ever done in my life. We, we mm -hmm. couldn't sleep that night. I must have talked about it for about till five in the morning. And I videotaped it. I actually videotaped over 38 years, something like that. I videotaped every show that I've done. I started wow. on VHS, high VHS, super VHS, high eight, mini TV, and digital. You know, I, seriously. And I still have that show. And it was so amazing. And it just made me fall more in love with hypnosis. I yeah. already loved hypnosis when I went through the training. I knew I had a calling. I had childhood trauma as a kid. Nephew got run over and crushed and killed in front of me at a fairgrounds. I, I was traumatized. Wow. No one ever helped me get over the trauma. Those days, you didn't see a therapist. It wasn't cool yeah. back in the uh, uh, early 60s to see somebody to talk about your problems. Everyone just buried it underneath the, you know, under the rug. But that was my first show, and I fell in love with hypnosis. And, and I, I thought about hypnosis 24 hours a day, seven days a week, dreamed of it. Yeah. And I still, I still have that same passion. You know that? Brilliant. I mean, um, one of the things that, that fascinated me with you as well is uh, you, you did a lot of stuff over in, in Asia uh, through translators. Uh, I mean, how did that come about and how how was it hypnotizing someone through a translator? Well, th that's a cool question. Thanks, Grant, for asking that. So um, I was on a roll in my hypnosis career, uh, doing stage hypnosis, uh, everything from fraternity parties on up, company corporate events, anything I could do, I did. Even rooms with 15, 10 people, I did stage hypnosis in their living yeah. rooms. Some hypnotists won't do it with small groups. Um, so I get a call from an agent named Abe Herschler. He's this old Israeli uh, agent on Hollywood Boulevard in Hollywood. So I go over there to meet some guy, this guy named Xu Ming, this guy from uh, Taiwan that wanted to bring hypnosis to Asia. And he told me he was looking for somebody for two years. He checked out Pat Collins. I don't know if you remember Pat Collins. He had yeah. hypnotist. So he checked her out, checked everybody out. And so I met with them and I showed them some videos of, of what I've done Some because I videotaped everything, some stage stuff, some therapy stuff. And so he said, you know, I want to take you to Asia. He goes, you're going to have to create a method to hypnotize someone through an interpreter. Never been done before and uh, that I knew of. And he said uh, he, he offered me fifteen hundred bucks a week 
for a five-year contract, no raises, just $1,500 a week. And I thought, wow, man, that's fantastic money. But beyond that, I thought, I get a chance to do something that no one's done before. Yeah. And uh, I talked to one of the big head hypnotists out here, a guy named John Kappas. And I, I talked to him and a few other you know, so-called heavy cats about it. And they said, you can't be done. You can't hypnotize people through interpreters. So um, I didn't listen to him, of course, because I don't like to listen to people. So I went out to, to Taiwan and uh, I worked with this um, interpreter, Dr. Wong, Timothy Wong, who was a geologist, knew nothing about hypnosis, which was great. And I worked with him for 14 hours a day for two weeks. These guys work a lot. These Asia people, they don't do a they don't do one or two gigs and then just say, OK, they can then they sit down having, you know, having a, a Mai Tai and relaxing. They, they work the hell out of you. So, yeah. um, you know, I, I worked for two weeks, 14 hours a day to crack the code of translingual hypnosis. Now, I call it a fancy name. I call it interlingual hypnotic transinduction. But it was just translingual no. hypnosis. But I'll tell everybody the formula. I will tell you how to actually do it if you want to work with an interpreter. Because I, I work with interpreters, you know, great. I do shock inductions. I do therapy. I do stage shows through interpreters. So how you do it is, thank you. I appreciate that, Natasha. Yeah, don't ever believe you can't do something and listen to somebody saying it can't be done. Yeah. Excuse me. It can't be done because they believe it can't be done. But I yeah. never stopped myself from exploring and, and testing and seeing if I can crack a code. So anyway, um, the, the way to do translingual hypnosis is not literal interpretation. If, if I say the word sleep, which I really don't like the word sleep because they're not going to sleep. But yet, as a stage hypnotist, we go, yo, sleep. You know, when I, you know, take my hand, look into my eyes, sleep. You know, so we're already confusing the public because if they're going to sleep, they wouldn't be able to hear us. You know, yeah. they're going to a state of focused concentration without without intellectual interpretation if they're in the real hypnosis zone. They're in a kind of controlled amnestic state, but operating under suggestion. So the key is to find out what words, what words represent the same meaning of the word as it is in English. So let me give you an example. I was trying to get these groups of Chinese people in Taiwan in 1994 to laugh and smile. I couldn't crack it. You know, they were like, you know, it's like I see a room full of people walking around. I don't, some cultures are repressed. They hold in emotions. I sometimes find that in certain even European cultures that were maybe under siege and war and stuff like that. You know, in America, they think, well, God, you Americans are, Americans are over the top. You're just way out there. You know, you're not reserved. Well, I don't want to be reserved. I want to <laughs> be who I am, you know. Yeah. But anyway, um, I'll never forget, I couldn't get them to laugh or smile even. So I, I, you know, I'd ask my interpreter, I said, so when I'm saying smile or laugh, he goes, well, we don't know what that means. He goes, but there's a word that in Chinese, some words that can represent that. And he said, those words in English would be smile from your heart or laugh, you know, smile from your heart is what he said. So I said, okay, well use those words. So then when I, when I, when he used those words, they started smiling. They started laughing. It's like, you know, we broke the code. Yeah. And so the interpretation of the language versus literal interpretation. I don't know if you hear my dog barking. Sorry about that. But <laughs> it's the literal. It's it's the interpretation of the meaning of the word that's most important. And if you can work with some uh, person that can speak English or whatever languages and the, and the other language, the native language or whatever, it's important that you explain what these words mean. You know, um, I'll never forget. I, I, we did a test on some, some guys. We were working on doing a TV show. So we did this test that when you awaken, you're going you're gonna to want to go to the bathroom and you're going to grab everything in the bathroom and bring it out. It was an old stage bit, you know, and these guys would go in the bathroom and they'd rip, rip the toilet paper out, the, the, the paper towels. They'd come back with all this stuff. So anyway, I did the, the suggestion. And uh, the guy didn't come out. He stayed in the bathroom. So 20 minutes later, I'm saying, Dr. Wong, where the hell is this the kid? And so we walked over the, and he was standing in the bathroom near the toilet, just standing there. So Dr. Wong asked him in Chinese, what happened? He said, 
I thought what you said was to go in the bathroom and wait for us to come get you. So you see, it, it took 14 hours for two weeks to crack the code of what is the correct interpretation of what that word represents yeah. to that culture. And if you can work with someone to understand what those interpretations are, that's why it works great to work with a fellow hypnotist in another country. But it can work real well to crack the code of translingual hypnosis. But that's the story of that. Yeah. Uh, interesting. Um, like the different cultures and how they respond as an audience. Um, I mean, in my kind of traveling, I've, I've noticed, I mean, American audiences and, and volunteers are brilliant. Um, what are different cultures like? What is a, a an Asian audience like for hypnotizability as such versus an American audience? Well, I think uh, I found that the Asian culture was easier to go into hypnosis. Hmm. Think about this. I, I was working in countries that used to be under um, a leadership by maybe a, a dictator or whatever you want to call them, you know, martial law or whatever. So they just like the military folks, they tend to follow orders much, much easier. Plus, yeah. one thing important when you're dealing with culture like the Asian culture, I don't have to do metaphors and stories and and all that i do direct literal suggestion in other words yeah. i give a suggestion for them to follow an instruction for them to follow and remember we're giving them instructions if the participant uh follows the instruction that's excellent thank you if the participant follows that instruction they will be able to have the effect. We're teaching yeah. them how to go into hypnosis. I'm not hypnotizing them unless I overstimulate the nervous system by do a shock induction and I and I amplify the sympathetic and they go into flight and escape into hypnosis, which sometimes we do when we have to maybe, if we want to call it, force someone into hypnosis. I had to do that with interrogation um, when I worked I was, with the I was guy. Just I was just yep. about to ask you exactly about that. I mean, one of the, the misconceptions or the things that's always said out there about hypnosis is, you know, you'll not reveal secrets and you'll not do this and you'll not do that. Um, but in the book that I read on the forensic hypnosis that you were doing, you were you were called in um, for exactly that. So explain that to us. That's my book, Kill the Hypnotist. Hey, man, they wanted me dead. They put out a life insurance policy the Department of Defense for the ex-wife who wanted to collect a million bucks who wanted me dead. My own wow. wife wanted to be gone, man. But, you know, I, I can't blame her. It was a million dollars and she had a $500,000 life insurance policy on me. So uh, she would have made out pretty good in the 1990s. Sorry wow. about that, honey, ex-honey. Anyway, any, anyway, um, I was called on when I was working in Taiwan. I was doing stage hypnosis. I was doing hypnotherapy. I was lecturing at the Buddhist Association, the police academy. I had a TV show every week. Um, yeah, absolutely. Koreans would be, they would be good recipients of hypnosis. Uh, have you ever worked with deaf people? You know, you, you can work with deaf people, and I can tell you how to do that a little later. Um, so um, in 1995, my agent, a, a group of guys, you know, government agents you know like secret agents and government guys they they asked me to come into some secret room so i go into this room with this oval table i'm sitting down with these government dudes now don't forget i'm just a hypnotist i'm doing therapy at home i'm doing therapy there in 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 taiwan i'm doing tv and stage and lecturing on on the therapeutic values of hypnosis they call me in and they want to know if i would help them on the biggest crime and murder in the history of Taiwan and France. Murder of Captain Ying, weapons procurement officer, um, who, whose head was crushed in, bashed in, and he was found floating in the ocean in Taiwan. The um, misappropriation of 2.8 billion, billion wow. US dollars. The purchase of six defective French frigate battleships from the Thompson Shipbuilding Company in France. And money laundered in South Africa and Asia and mainland Chinese people paid off to buy um, Italian minesweepers. This big whole government deal. So they're asking me that. You know what? As they're asking me if I'd want to work on it, I swear to God, it's like the hair is on my arms. I don't have much hair anymore because I'm getting old. But it was standing up. I'm thinking, hell no, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to, uh, you know, it can't be done and I'm not going to do it. And I'm not going to get bumped off. You know, I'm still in my early stages of hypnosis. 
and I'm, I don't want to be a casualty in their war, you know? So I said, sorry, you know, I, I don't want to do it. So um, I continued doing my work and, and continued going back home and coming to Taiwan every, every, you know, a few times a year. I set a world's record hypnotizing 3,800 people in a world's record show through an interpreter in, in Chinese and Mandarin Chinese at a big wow. world's record show with other world record holders and stuff. So in 1996, my agent approached me again and said, hey, they can't, they don't know what happened exactly in this crime. Who killed Captain Yin? Would you be willing to come back and do it? You might be able to help save the morality of the Taiwan uh, military, the Navy, and maybe clear the dead captain's reputation because they thought he was part of the crime. So I said, yeah, I'll do it. I'll come back and do it, you know? And, and at that point, I don't know what hit me, but I said, wow, I get to try to hypnotize military prisoners. You know, it's easier to hypnotize willing subjects. You do a stage show. If I do a high school football team or a high school show and you ask for volunteers, they're all running up. They're fighting in the chairs. You guys have seen that when you do these stage shows. But, you know, they want me to hypnotize imprisoned military procurement officers against their will. So I thought, well, OK, I'm going to try it. What do I got to lose? And then I had all these other big hypnotists telling me it can't be done again. The same people. I won't mention all their names, but <laughs> guys that you pro that you probably know, you know, um, telling me it can't be done, including one guy who ran a school called the Omni School of Hypnosis. <laughs> and so, um, uh, so I, I decided, well, hell, I'm going to do it. So I created a a, a set of questions that we we're going to ask these prisoners when they come in to see me. So I fly to Taiwan. Now I'm starting to get scared. What the hell did I sign up for? You know. I'm still making that 1500 bucks a week, no matter what I do, you know, um, um, but now I'm working on this murder case. So they so they drive me to this military prison and I walk in this room and it's an interrogation room, man. I mean, they might as well have shackles and, and the things to disembowel people and the rack and all that. But it was like this cold, scary torture room. And I, I said to my interpreter and, and these agents, the head of police and military, I said, hey, I said, guys, we can't do it in this room. You got to make this look like a hypnotherapy office. And so I explained to them, we need to put some pictures on the walls, put some, put a recliner, a comfortable chair there, a table to keep me on one side and the, the prisoner on the other side, because I didn't want him to break my neck and snap my neck at any time, because it could happen. Seriously, it could happen. No joke. So so they convert this cold interrogation room into like a little hypnotherapy room. We looked really good. They did it in about four or five hours. So wow. so now they're going to bring the prisoner back. But before they do that, I'm in the room um, with all these agents, the head of police, head of counterintelligence, head of the uh, Secret Service, uh, Colonel Ng, um, head of technology. And all of a sudden there's a newspaper on the table. I look at the freaking newspaper and there's my picture in the newspaper. Now, this was a secret mission. They weren't supposed <laughs> to know. The press wasn't supposed to know Tamu, the big hypnotist is back in Taiwan. You know, they were there. They were in those days. It was cool. I'd have hundreds of kids running up to me, wanting me to sign their autographs. I was Tamu, Tamu. Wow. You know, they were doing they were doing school plays of stage hypnotist Tamu, you know, in, in school nice. in, in Taiwan, of all things. So um, I freaked out because the press knew I was there and I was supposed to be hidden on secret bases and everything. So anyway, um, the first guy comes in and he, they bring him in. And this dude is the one accused of the murder. Alex, uh, Colonel Ku is his name. K-U-O, uh, uh, I think it is. So he comes in. He's shackled. He's handcuffed, shackled, blindfolded. And he's wearing this prison outfit. I'm thinking... Jesus, this is like some Fellini movie. This is like some acid trip or something. I'm going, I can't believe I'm here. And, and this guy's coming in and he's like a real prisoner, you know? So so they put him on, they they sit him down uh, on, on one side and I'm on the other side with, with my interpreter. But we created a really good um, questionnaire to ask him questions. I figured if I can get to know him, if I can get him to talk and kind of be a friend, find out, what is if he had religion, if he had faith, if he had if he had um, goals in the future, if he saw that there was hope, then maybe I could work with him. The story was mm -hmm. and it was true 
that I was invited by the Taiwan government to help you with your psychological and physical issues of being incarcerated. Don't forget, these guys were tortured. They were waterboarded. Who knows? Probably beaten like crazy. I mean, some of these countries, they do some pretty weird stuff to get the truth out of you. If you're going to if it's actually the truth, I, I'd probably say anything to get them to stop torturing me, you know. So. Uh, so anyway, um, and and it was all through an interpreter. So so I worked with them for about two or three hours just to get to know them. And then I did the technique to various techniques because I tried all kinds of things. I wanted to see what would work the best. The mm. bottom line is I got him in hypnosis. We were, since he was Buddhist, I regressed him to a past life memory and he went back and relived. If, if any of you have done age regression, you know, sometimes person has full vivification of that experience. They're like back there. Some of you know, sometimes they're even speaking like a child or speaking in, in a, in an accent if they're in some yeah. other country. I mean, if you've ever really done a lot of past life regression, you'll know there's something probably very powerful, powerful about it. Can it be imagination? Heck yeah. But can it be real? Maybe so. You know, I'm not going to tell you my belief, but the bottom line is um, that I was able to facilitate a true past life regression. So then what we did, I taught the government how to ask non-leading questions. So I spent hours with the head of police and the other guys. I figured if I ask questions, I'm leading them. I'm the hypnotist. They're suggestible to me. But my job was to regress them back to December 9th, 10th, and 11th of 1993 and to bring in the team of investigators to ask specific, direct, non-emotional, and non-leading questions. And, um, uh, and, and it was successful. They got information out of this guy that they could never have gotten with anything else. They were blown away. And the interrogation lasted eight hours. Can you imagine eight hours? And I created the finger of truth. I had his hand in the air tied into his central nervous system. So if the sucker lied, this would start happening. It'd start creating a disturbance in the in the sympathetic nervous systems. You know, it would it was like a human lie detector is what I call yeah. it. I never did it before. I didn't know if it was going to work. But it also indicated to me that the guy was in what you might call a trance state because his hand was suspended in the air without any muscle tension or pain or anything for eight hours. And wow. it was fantastic. So that was the first of many interrogations. And in July of 1997, the government gave me a gold plate of honor for my work. And then I continued back in 1999 to hypnotize everyone involved. There were secret cameras hidden everywhere, tissue boxes. I mean, it was like a it was like a freaking James Bond movie. But and it was really cool. It was fantastic. I yeah. mean, sometimes when you do things on the edge and you succeed in them, it's like the greatest feeling that you can ever imagine. And you guys who, who you who have done stuff like that, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, it's I mean, it is that it's it's constantly playing with it and playing with the boundaries. And it's beyond that where where stuff is, you know. Um, yeah. Um, talk about playing with the boundaries and, and, and developing new things. Uh, the first time I saw your kind of uh, the, the, the EEG machines where people were wired up to that. So you could you could visually see the change in brainwaves whilst we're being hypnotized. Um, how did that come about? Yeah. Well, you know, I was working with Orman McGill. Um, now, I don't know. I hope some of you guys know who Orman McGill is. He was called the Dean of American Hypnotists. If not, he wrote a lot of books on hypnotism as well as uh, magic and, and his experiences of, of hypnotism and mysticism in India and the Orient. Orman was a great guy. So I was, thanks, Roy. Yeah, he was truly, he was an amazing he was the most enlightened human being I ever met. This guy mm. was in a state of cosmic consciousness. I mean, to me, I was a kind to, compared to him. I was a kindergarten kid, you know. Um, so Orman and I were working in 1995 on 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 frequencies. We were working on various sound frequencies that related to uh, alpha, theta and delta. 0.1 hertz up to about 7 hertz. So we were trying to crack the code of creating frequencies that would alter consciousness, alter brainwave patterns in a person to, uh, to produce them, uh, to condition them into hypnosis. And I always know that I always knew that there was a science behind hypnosis. 
And so when I was talking with my interpreter in Taiwan, we started discussing utilizing diagnostic medical tools. So we came up with the conclusion that an EEG, brainwave frequency monitoring, um, a, a, a machine that monitors, it's called electroencephalograph, that can monitor brainwave frequencies, um, that that could represent different areas of consciousness, changes of consciousness. And so I started pioneering the uh, scientific testing of EEG and how that represented and related to hypnosis. And then I started working on understanding the various brainwave activity states, gamma, uh, which could be 30 to about 60 hertz, um, beta, which is waking consciousness, which could be about 14 to 30 hertz, which is activity in the frontal lobe area, which is cognitive conscious intellectual activity that's highly um, active. Um, alpha, which is, could be anywhere from about 7 to 14 hertz, which represents stages of meditation, relaxation, and, and, and a form of hypnosis. And then theta and delta, which could relate to stages of deep relaxation, natural sleep, or more profound hypnosis, and then the states of what we call sonambulism. Now, you know, sonambulism is a word that was created by a, a very a, a French scientist, a person that was exploring uh, magnetism, mesmerism, named Persiger. And sonambulism yeah. is that state of, of waking hypnosis without conscious awareness of what's going on. Some medicines do that, like Ambien. So some people are natural somnambulists. They're sleepwalkers. Yes. So when you think about what occurs with the most profound states of hypnosis in hypnosis shows or in private practice is creating a state of waking somnambulism. So they're doing things. They're not interpreting what they're doing. You're, you have direct uh, communication into that subconscious to stimulate imagination or reality. And some of those people, when they when they come back to full consciousness, might experience amnesia, amnestic states, or complete total memory loss. Those of you who've done stage hypnosis, you know that's one of the experience of the participators in a stage show. And so I started really utilizing and understanding and testing and validating uh, hypnosis as it relates to brainwave frequency changes. Now, the mind operates on frequencies and activity. Now, the scientists call that mind power. I can call it amplitude or neuro uh, neuro uh, dynamic activity. And think about this. Think about a computer. And we were doing this at the beginning when I wasn't able to, to hear the volume too loud. So look at a look at a cell phone or a computer or, or television. You turn the channel and you're changing the frequency, and then you turn up the volume, which makes it louder. And think about emotions. Think about a person that could be in an emotional state, whether they're fully conscious or they're in that state of hypnosis. And emotions and body tension and muscle tension is the activity within those frequencies. So I realized that using a diagnostic medical tool, number one, brings me to a different level of hypnosis mm -hmm. because it brings me into a neurophysiological level of hypnosis. But at the same time, it's a tool to validate that there has been a change of activity in the various areas of consciousness. And the various areas of consciousness, we can call it cup, we can call it conscious. Most people don't know this term, pre-conscious, which is the area of uh, right below the level of consciousness called the pre-conscious, which is also the state where you can retrieve memories in a waking state. And then we have the unconscious and the subconscious. Now, um, so I started investigating it, scientifically testing it, teaching it in my courses. And I'm a big believer that that neuroscientific hypnosis is a wave of the future because mm. it's incorporating medical science, or we can just call it the aspects of really incorporating scientific diagnostic tools into hypnosis, just like biofeedback, galvanic skin response, which was used to monitor changes in the autonomic nervous system. Like that, beautiful, right. Different images in the MRI, absolutely. Can you also go into self-hypnosis? To what extent is it possible? Now, now that's that's an excellent question too. So um, remember those questions because uh, we can talk about them, but you're our leader here, so I'll let you continue, Graham. 
Yeah, yeah. Um, kind of pulling it back to the stage stuff as well. Um, you must have had um, some uh, fantastic experiences, but during that process, uh, through that, there must have been some some bad experiences, like the first time you've bombed on stage, which I know a lot of times is for a lot of people that are starting out in stage hypnosis, they do a couple of good shows, everything's wonderful, uh, they have some successes and then they have that then first couple of failures, which knocks a lot of people off the game and stops them from experimenting and pushing further. So tell us about, I mean, it's probably a long time since it's happened, but tell us about uh, a, a failure and what you learned from that. Oh, absolutely. This is a good one. Um... You know, I, my first show was such a great show, and and maybe I maybe it, it should have not been so great because all of a sudden I'm thinking this is going to be the way it is every time I do a stage show. It's just going to be a piece of cake and I a cakewalk. It's going to be easy. So now I'm doing my second show, and this was at a Jewish temple in Hollywood. Now now I'm getting a little arrogant and a little cocky, carried away with myself already after one show. Can you believe it? So I invite the guy who's running the, the HMI school, George Kappas. He still is the owner of, of HMI out there now. I invite him to bring his camera and to videotape me doing my second stage hypnotism show. So now I'm thinking, okay, well, they're going to do everything I tell them to do anyway. It's, it's, it's so easy. So now I'm going to do the bit. You know how sometimes they do the bit in the old days where you bite into an a, a onion and yeah. you think it's a juicy apple. So they're just eating this onion and stuff like that. So now I'm going to do it, but I don't want to do the onion. I'm going to have them. I'm, my bit is I'm going to have them bite into an apple. And they're going to think they're biting into like an onion or a lemon or something. That's going to taste terrible. So I, I figured I'll just do it that way instead of giving them an onion. I'll, I'll do it the easy way. Have them bite into something sweet and it's going to taste awful. So now I'm doing the stage show. And again, again, I got that recorded too. So I'm doing that show. And uh, all of a sudden I get to the bit and the rabbi's wife is also in the show. And the rabbi's out there with, with it, people in the audience watching the show. So I do the bit. I get, I say, I give the lady an apple. I said, now you're going to bite into this, this sour, bitter, juicy lemon. This, you know, you're going to bite into it and it's going to taste awful. And I'm giving her an apple. So I figured I would still get the same kind of reaction, but but I'm having her just bite into an apple so I don't create any distress. So I'm uh, we're get I'm ready to do the bit. I give it to her. I say, okay, so take a bite of this. And I said, I say, take a bite of this, this sour, juicy, bitter lemon. And she takes a big bite of it. And I say, what's it taste like? And she goes, an apple. And everyone <laughs> starts laughing at me. She said, an apple. And I, all of a sudden, man, my ego drops to the ground. I'm thinking, oh, man, I got the head of the school there. Everyone's laughing at me. I'm just an idiot. And all of a sudden, I'm starting to beat myself up. But I remembered the philosophy of, of showmanship. On with the show. Just continue. Yeah. Don't, don't make a big deal about it. Because you make a big deal about it, everyone's going to make a big deal about it. So yeah. I just... I just they all laughed at me. It was over. It was funny. They made, you know, Tom Silver, the funny, you know, guy fails. So I just continued the, the, the show and it went great. And so I do a bit now. And this is a little dramatic thing. And because I like to do like music and, and, and acting and stuff. So I tell this, uh, I tell the um, rabbi's wife that she's the leading star of a big movie. And when the song comes on, it was this uh, love story song. Where do I begin? I'm not a singer, but dramatic <laughs> love song. I said, you're going to go up to your leading man. You're going to give him a kiss. It's such a kiss. You haven't given a kiss like this in years. But as you're kissing him, you're going to realize your lips are stuck together and that you cannot stop kissing. And the more you try to stop kissing, the more you kiss him because your lips are going to be glued together. So I start the music. She gets up all dramatic. She goes up to him. She's giving him this big kiss. This is the same show. So then I say, well, when I touch on your shoulder, you're going to realize that's not your sweetheart you're kissing. That's a stranger. So what they usually do is they, they open their eyes and they push him away. That's exactly what she did. She, she's kissing him. And I said, that's a stranger. She looks at him. She pushes him real hard away. Now I've created some kind of uh, family war. At the end of the show, he was so mad at her. How could you reject me? He said in front of the congregation and everybody. 
You know, I had to try to convince them that she was in an altered reality state and she was just accepting the suggestion that she still loves you. And, you know, but it was really it was really interesting. But the show turned yeah. off good. I did make a fool of myself. Now, one time I was doing a show in Beverly Hills for a bunch of actors and famous people. Now, this was a big mistake. Now, I usually I, I used to do this bit. Remember, I said I used to do this bit. And this bit was in a moment, I ask you to stand up and to follow me. But as soon as you start to walk, you'll realize your your feet are cemented to the ground and you can't move no matter how hard you try. Uh, you know, you know that bit, right? Yeah. yeah. So that's an old stage thing. So um, I'm standing right in front of the guy and I'm in this restaurant. So I go, OK, open your eyes. And then he opens his eyes. I said, come out of hypnosis. I go, stand up. Now I say, OK, I want you to follow me. And I'm standing right in front of him. I go, I want you to follow me. So he goes to take this big step. He can't move. He falls right on top of me. I hear my ankle crack. I hear the <laughs> in my ankle. I'm thinking, oh, man, I broke my ankle. You know, here I'm, I'm I got this dead weight, this 240 pounds of dead weight on top of me. And I'm thinking, what do I do now? This guy's on top of me, you know. And so so I bring him back to full awareness. I, I kind of I, I have him sit back down in his chair. I stand up and I'm all like limping and I complete the show and I go home and I go to a doctor. And luckily, I didn't crack my ankle. I sprained it real bad. Oh. But I had the subject under hypnosis fall right on top of me because oh. he took the suggestion literally. Yeah. And and had I not been in front of him, he would have fallen smack on the ground and maybe he would have hurt himself. So I'm glad I was like the, the person to cushion, cushion him. But that was really kind of scary when that happened. I can tell you yeah. one, one other interesting story where I almost got oh, killed on stage. Oh, go on. <laughs> okay. I was doing a stage show for Alcoholics Anonymous and I love AA. It's a great program. Believe me. In fact, 12 years of total sobriety. Thank you. Thank you. 12 years yeah. of total sobriety I have. Um, so I, I, I'm doing this show and I'm doing the bit, the post hypnotic suggestion. Every time I say, ladies and gentlemen, you can't stand the way I say it. You're going to tell me to shut up. Now, there was a few times I almost got beat up or thrown out of windows because I carried it a little too far and stopped it before I, the guy got so angry they'd hurt me. So I was doing it with a lady. So I'm sitting down. I'm saying, is everyone having a good time? And they're all saying, yeah. I go, well, uh, let me talk to you a little bit about hypnosis. I'm Tom Silver. And she would get mad and say, ah, shut up. So and I say, are you having fun? She goes, oh, yeah, I'm having a great time. Can I tell the, the people in the audience how, how wonderful hypnosis is? Oh, yeah. Well, what I'm trying to show you, ladies and gentlemen, ah, shut up. So all of a sudden in the audience, I hear someone yell, leave her alone. Well, he actually threw in the cuss word that starts with an F. And ends with a K. So I don't know how censored you guys are. But um, uh, so uh, I'm not going to say that word, actually. So <laughs> he goes, leave her the blank alone. So all of a sudden, I think, uh oh, I better stop this bit. So I stopped the bit and I'm continuing. So now I'm doing a, a lady. I'm doing a, um, a Lady Gaga impersonation contest to see who can sing the best Lady Gaga song in, a, in like an impersonation contest on stage. So as I'm doing this. My back's to the audience, and all of a sudden, some lunatic, some loony, has a big bottle, and he's running as fast as he can onto the stage. He passes my sound guy, who's a big guy, but my sound guy didn't want to touch him because my sound guy got scared of this guy. He was, like, insane. It's like, I don't know what, what he flipped out on or if he was on drugs, but he wanted to knock me out. I think he wanted to kill me on stage. He wanted to hit me over the head with a bottle. So he's running onto the stage. And luckily, some guys, because uh, it's an AA convention, see him running on, and they grab him just as he's jumping up. And I turn around, and they're grabbing this guy, and they're forcing him out of the room. But he had the bottle in the hand, and had he... Oh. That bottle probably could have killed me. And that was wow. the closest I'd come in a stage show to being killed. <laughs> um, but it was interesting. Wow. Yeah, I mean, it's the joy of it's the, the the joy of doing stage is almost anything can happen, uh, and when you do enough shows, then almost anything does happen. Uh, that is amazing. I also ask guests this as well. Um, I also kind of say uh, for for two two book recommendations uh, for either books you have written 
uh, or books you have read uh, over the years that you think would help people within their career of being a performance hypnotist, uh, whether it be on stage or, or kind of demonstrations or talks? Well, I, you know, Orman wrote a great book called The Encyclopedia of Stage Hypnosis. And he also wrote his first stage hypnotism book. Now, in that book, um, uh, there was a foreword. I think Paul McKenna asked him if he could write the foreword to that book. So I believe Paul McKenna is on the foreword to Orman's book. But that's really, really a great book. Um, hmm. There's also a really good series of books that were written the, in this in the last century. And it was called the um, uh, um, I have a copy of it it's like the it's a four book series on all the different scientific research that was done in the various phenomenons of hypnosis in um in europe in the uk um in the netherlands and it was it's really a, an astounding book but but there are some great authors of books uh, the only books that i really like reading are the books like by dr elliotson who was a neurologist and a medical doctor in the 1840s um, you know, suggestive therapeutics. If you ever want to really read a really great book, um, written in the late, late 1800s, early 1900s, it's a book on, on the medical faculty using hypnosis through all types of different physical and mental and disease disorders. And it was called the book on suggestive therapeutics. So there are a lot of good books out there. I, I actually prefer reading books like by, uh, James Airsdale who is performing um, certain types of anesthesia, mm -hmm. anesthetics, uh, the book of, of uh, mesmerism in, in India and his book, James Airsdale. Um, so those kinds of books are really good. There's a lot of good books out there if you want to yeah. you know, read on hypnotism. Uh, but if you're really looking for a good stage hypnosis book that really has a lot of information um, and uh, the Martian Routine clips show, I believe, where it was. Yeah, 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 to finish it off, it was the Martian Routine, and a woman in a blue hoodie and jeans does a backflip. It was crazy and awesome. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And the funny thing was, she knew nothing about gymnastics. She oh, knew wow. nothing about gymnastics. But, yes, she did a black backflip. Oh, this reminds me of something. Oh, man, I got to tell this story. This is again with the ex-wife who didn't collect the million dollars life insurance policy <laughs> and was pissed off when I came home on the 11th day instead of the 10 days uh, that I was supposed to be gone. I came home on the 11th day, my last mission. Anyway, this is this was in Southern California and it was a Christmas party and Santa Claus was in the audience watching the show. And this was my early days of hypnotism where I had long hair and sideburns and a mustache. I was really kind of cool in those days. So um, not that I'm not cool now. I am kind of cool. What the heck? So this Very company cool. was called, thanks. It was called Humphrey Yogurt, which is great. Humphrey Bogart. Was That's a great name. Humphrey Yogurt. So I did this, I did the same bit with, you're going to look out in the audience, you're going to see a naked audience. But then I say, but guess what? People on stage, they're not naked. You're naked. Where's your clothes? And then I have some funny music playing. And you either have people hiding like this or you got the extroverts with their legs out, and their arms out. You can actually see who really uh, is very confident with their sexual um, <laughs> yeah. um, physicalness, so to speak. Yes. So anyway, so I, so I do this bit and I go, people on stage, they're not naked. You're naked. All of a sudden, this guy jumps up. He runs out of the restaurant. So I have a subject on stage. I've got this on film, man. I'll find I'll find it. Maybe you can post it so you can see Absolutely, what happened. Yeah. yeah. So this this young man jumps up. He runs out of the restaurant. I'm thinking, where the hell did he go? The guy's <laughs> gone. You know, he's he ran down a busy street. Now I'm thinking, well, what if he runs out in the middle of the road and gets killed by a cop or, or a car? Now, now I'm going to be the imprisoned stage hypnotist, you know, in San Quentin. So I so I'm waiting. I don't know what to do. So um, so the subjects are still on stage. So I just throw them back into hypnosis. And I tell Suzanne, who's on the other side of the restaurant, I say, go get them. So now she runs out. And I, and I wonder, not Suzanne, that's my current wife. Sorry. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> the ex-wife. 
Hey, I've been married three times. I, I, I'm holding four. I've been married three. I've been married three times. So uh, I have been married three times. So I said, Renee, go get them. So she disappears, and now I'm wondering where the heck are they? So I walk out of the restaurant. I, I'm leaving the people subjects on stage hypnotized. So they're just kind of like props, you know. I, I walk out and I see her down at the end of the street, and this guy is hiding behind some kind of wire trash can a trash can that's like hard wire so you can kind of see through it so he's hiding behind it like this so then all of a sudden i see renee holding her hands out like this and kind of walking sideways and the guy like hiding right in in front of her as she's walking him back in so then she, um we get him back into the room um put him back into hypnosis and then i finished the show i left him in the show and we finished the show so I asked her, what'd you do? She said, well, I went out there and the guy was hiding behind a, tr a wire trash can. And um, yeah, really, I would be, I don't want to be, I don't want to be divorced again. Believe me, she, she's a great lady. I'm really thankful. I'm, I'm not going to make that mistake. And I'm not going to tell her I made that mistake. Um, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so, so I said to um, Renee, I said, what'd you do? She goes, I kept telling him to come back into the restaurant. And he said, he keeps saying, I can't come in. I'm naked. All I have is my tennis shoes on. Now, I don't know where that came from. All he had was his tennis shoes on. So she said, I told him I had a big jacket and I'll shield you so no one could see you. So, so she's shielding him to get him back in. So later on, I thought, wow, I want to see what this video shows. So mm. when I watched the video... And I did the naked audience and everyone's laughing. He's looking like this. He's looking. He was afraid to look at the naked audience. And then when I said, you're naked, he ran out. So as a therapist, I thought, well, this guy must have had a trigger and he must have yeah. went back to some weird um, sexual, negative sexual experience because yeah. people people get raped and stuff like that. And a pretty high percentage of, of females and males have also been sexually violated when they were children by friends and family. So I saw that and it really made me think, think about that, that bit. Um, and cause you never know, you never know yeah. a simple stage hypnosis bit might have an ab reaction. Yeah. Has that ever yeah. happened to you? Have you ever had some kind of weird reaction? I've, uh, I've had three serious ab reactions from people on stage and it's always been that it's something has happened and it's it's opened a, you know a memory but i'm quite i'm quite conscious of it's that's the one thing i look for on stage you know and you know any good stage it is exactly the same if i see someone that's starting to act a little bit you know not the way i want them to I will, I will move them from the situation rather than have them on stage. And sometimes even when you need that volunteer and you know they're brilliant, but their well-being is the most important thing. Um, but, yeah, there's nothing there's nothing more sobering on stage than when your show's going well and all of a sudden someone just bursts into tears for no reason. You know, you've got to, you've got to kind of contain that quickly. Well, you know, and you're absolutely right. And and you've got to be aware of the physiological changes and, yeah. and different body language. Number yeah. one, if you start seeing stress or tension building in the face, it's the yeah. outcropping of an emotion coming up because they're in a low frequency state. They're closer yeah. to the to the memory files. If you see extreme twitching, now you know there's something called REM, and that's like rapid eye movement, right? REM. But yeah. if you see extreme twitching in a subject, whether it's in therapy or on a stage show, and you see this kind of thing going on, I yeah. know from all my years of work around the world and mass hypnosis, that represents buried trauma. I didn't learn that in the schools because the schools basically made it sound like that hypnosis is just safe and nothing can happen. That they never told me about these different ab reactions or mm -hmm. emotional triggers that could set something up. Um, yeah. I had to learn them through experience. If you see someone starting to perspire and you're seeing an elevation of the breathing, the autonomic nervous system, the respiratory system accelerating, that's also an indication that that person is having something going on internally. Yeah. And maybe at that point, take them out of hypnosis yeah. real quickly with a positive suggestion. Uh, Thank him for being up here on the stage 
and then ask them to go to the audience to sit down and enjoy the rest of the show. Yeah. But if you let the meltdown occur, I call it stepping on a landmine. There are those yeah. landmines. That's why I, I don't know about you, but I personally feel anyone doing demonstrational hypnosis, stage hypnosis, um, um, you know, group hypnosis, understands hypnosis also as a science. I think that it's important Absolutely. to have an education in the field of, of hypnosis or hypnotherapy if you want to be yeah. a really good therapist out there and not have something very dangerous occur. As you know, there have yeah. been lawsuits. I've been a consultant in two major lawsuits and with some people that you even know that involved yeah. even Harris Hotel in Las Vegas. And I had to review the footage and, 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 and actually see where an incorrect suggestion or an over-amplified participant should have been excused off the show before they did something to hurt somebody else in that show. Yeah. So it's important. Yeah. The well-being and safety of, of the volunteers is your number one goal. Not, not your ego and not you proving, yeah. hey, I once went to a show years ago and i saw um marshall silver i couldn't believe it man i saw marshall silver in a show because when my younger days i'd watch these guys i'd kind of see what i liked and see what i didn't like i saw him take a lady wearing a beautiful dress when when she fell on the floor i saw him pull her take her by her hair and drag her across the stage with her beautiful dress on on the floor drag her across the stage to show his power of hypnosis and and i thought i thought that was disgusting i just tell it like it is you know i saw another guy his um he was doing a show at a place called pi mcflies which was a club in southern california i used to work at some of the comedy clubs and stuff like that and nice. he was there and he was going to do the orgasm he was going to have this woman have an orgasm in her chair a mother was in the audience and the mother begged to him i was there i saw it um his name was travis fox i don't care i'll say his name i really don't care so his <laughs> mother begged to him in front of everybody please take my daughter out of hypnosis and let me take her home and he in front of everybody and she was crying the mother was crying oh. he said he said shut the f up and get the hell out of my club this is my show he kicked yeah. the daughter out of the club um and forced her to have an orgasm in the chair um and then had to remember what she did oh. so personally when i see that kind of stuff i, I get bothered by it you know and sometimes yeah. i get called by by uh you know by lawyers and and i got uh, the guy that was being sued at harris i saw the footage and it was a, it, what he did. Let me tell you about this guy. This was the guy that saw one of my stage hypnosis videos, and he became the stage hypnotist. He was doing Marshall Silver's show. Marshall Silver was having a little bit of um, overindulging in certain um, um, uh, things to alter frequencies of consciousness. I'm not going to tell you what he's doing. So he wasn't able to do certain stage shows at, at a certain period of time. You know, he was too out of it. So, um, so this guy was doing the Marshall Silver Show. Now, when he did Marshall Silver Show, he had to memorize every word that Marshall, he had to become Marshall Silver, Yeah, literally. And and uh, so he was doing Marshall Silver Show. So he did the routine, and I used to do this. I say I would say, hi, I'm Tom Silver. And, and then some guy, I had a little fake horse, a horse with a stick, and guy would jump up and go, hi oh Silver! And he'd be riding his little... <laughs> wooden horse around the stage so this guy did it where he would say the name harris harris hotel a guy would jump up and he'd say i love harris so here's the suggestion he gave him he said when i say harris or harris hotel or something like that you'll jump off off your chair you'll say i love harris and you'll you'll run off the stage down the stairs to the end of the room you'll come run back up run back on the stairs, say, I love Harris Hotel. Sit back down in your chair and go back into hypnosis. So when the guy did that, the guy jumped off the stage and broke his ankle. Oh. So, so the lawyers representing him were suing Harris Hotel. 
Now I was hired by this guy's this guy's um, lawyers, and this guy has the same first name I do. I was hired by his lawyers to to prove that this guy was innocent. But when I reviewed the footage and heard what he said, when I say Harris, you'll jump off your chairs, your chair, you'll 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 run off the stage down the stairs. He said you'll run off the stage. Yeah, down the stairs. He didn't say you'll you'll run down the stairs or you'll safely r- walk down the stairs, run down to the end of the room, you know, run back to the stairs, walk safely up the stairs, sit back down in the chair and go into hypnosis. He said you'll 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 run off the stage down the stairs. The guy was a literal yeah. interpreting subject, yeah. so he ran off the stage. So yeah. they were going to go to they were going to go to jury. So the guy, the lawyers that hired me to prove that this hypnotist was innocent, I was going to go into the court and prove that the guy was guilty because he goofed up on the suggestion to the literal guy. I was going to help fry him, but but justice needed to be done. The guy yeah. broke his ankle. The guy followed his instructions. So they settled out of court anyway. Both of the cases were settled out of court, um, um, but uh, it was very interesting. The first one was, the first one, the hypnotist did all these things to really create a really dangerous environment I won't go into details because, you know, you, you know, some of these people, I don't want to make a big deal about it. But the bottom line is, you know, I have to do what I have to do because the most important thing is the safety and welfare. And for yeah. people to understand, hypnosis is an art and it is a science. And if you do it, it was, well, you can be a success. It was part of the motivation for starting this series as such. That, you know, in, in lockdown, there's a lot of people that are, uh, in, in the UK especially, I don't know about the US, but it's, you know, people that get into stage hypnosis, That it's a very individual thing. There isn't a community as such where people are trying to better themselves. And, and this kind of series was kind of speaking to experts in the field of kind of hypnosis and stage hypnosis so that we can all do better because, my competition isn't someone, you know, another hypnotist doing a show. It's it's another hypnotist doing a bad show. The more the more good hypnotists are, the better the performers that are out there, the least incidents they are, the more shows there is for everybody. So, well, yeah. absolutely. Absolutely. And let's face it, we do have X-rated stage hypnotists and others yep. that do more standard shows. Hey, I was the NBA halftime show hypnotist. Hip, you know, hypnotizing people at, at number one top basketball games for 14 years and NBA and NCAA college basketball and women's basketball and WNBA. So I always like to do a show that was entertaining and it was fun and positive, but not something that was a little bit, although I have done some of those other types of things yeah. on show. Um, but I, I try my best really to make it a fun experience for everybody. And remember, I'm only as good as somebody's desire to participate. I'll never forget one, one time Orman McGill asked me to come to one of my stage shows. I got to tell you guys this because I think the stage hypnotist will find this pretty interesting. So Orman was doing some lectures at the Gilboyne um, uh, organization. And so he said to me, he says, Tom, can I come and see one of your stage shows? I thought, well, how cool. Or can you still hear me and see me? Yeah. Can you? Okay. So I thought, how cool. Orman's coming to one of my stage shows. Now, I don't know about you guys and gals, but I was one of those kind of stage hypnotists that if I didn't really think you were in hypnosis, if I really didn't think that you were truly engaged in the hypnotic state, I'd release you off the show. I'd, yeah. get, I'd get you back into the audience. Consequently, sometimes I'd start with 10 or 15 people and I'd have one or two people <laughs> to do the show because I'd get rid of everybody because I would, yeah. would always think, well, maybe this person's really not hypnotized. Maybe they're too conscious or whatever it was. Um, yep, the Washington. Uh, yep, absolutely. The bullets. Uh, so um, Orman comes to my show and it's a big company corporate event. You know, it's a suit and tie deal. I'd always show up with a suit and tie because I say, hi, I'm Tom Silver. You know, I'm a hypnotherapist. I love showing the creativity and imagination of the subconscious mind. But I want people to know that that I took hypnosis serious and that I was a hypnotherapist. I got so much work out of hypnotherapy from my stage shows, radio yeah. shows, and TV shows. So I do the show, and I must have started with about 12 or 15 people. By the end, I had like three or four th- people in the show. It was a good show. 
Orman at the end says to me, Tom, he goes, that was a great show, but let me ask you a question. I said, what, Orman? He goes, why did you get rid of so many people? <laughs> Orman's saying to me, why did you, why'd you tell so many people to go back to the audience? I said, well, Orman, I just, I didn't think they were all hypnotized. So then he said to me, he goes, were they, were they having fun in your show? And I said, yeah. He goes, were they trying to belittle you and make fun behind your back or to kind of uh, affect your show to be, you know, a bad show? Because sometimes you have those fakers on there that try to make yeah. a fool out of the stage hypnotist. And I said, no. He goes, keep them in. He goes, keep them in. If they're participating and having fun, it's not up to you to take them away from that experience. And it's not up to you to judge if they were being, if they're really in hypnosis or not. He goes, as you know, we are all going in and out of hypnosis all the time. But he goes, but if they're participating and they're having fun in the show, he goes, keep them in. Let them enjoy the experience of the stage show. And after yeah. that, I changed yeah. my whole philosophy. Now, if somebody was totally not following the instructions and they were looking around at people and they were waving at someone in the audience, I'd remove them. But after yeah. that, I changed my whole philosophy of not judging who's ha who's hypnotizing, who's not. If they're participating and they're having fun in their own zone of hypnosis, I always keep them in. And I've always kept them in. And I thought it was a fantastic. It took so much pressure off me trying to yeah. always analyze who's really hypnotized and who's faking it. You know, so it was. It, thank you, Jason. It was brilliant advice. And and Orman changed my whole my whole thought process. I had so many more people in the shows because everyone's having different experiences. Yes. Some of them are are really in that sonambulist, uh, we can call it artificial, created sonambulist state. They're having altered reality, truly full altered reality. Some are doing everything, but they don't have control of stopping themselves from doing it. They're aware yeah. of what they're doing, but their fear or their conscious resistance is not strong enough to to have them not perform uh, the the demonstrations. Someone yeah. else is very aware of what they're doing, but they're engaged, they're having fun. Maybe the first time in their life, they get to be somebody and feel like there's something special or a star. So they're having fun. They're totally aware of what they're doing, but they're still hypnotized. I've, I've had to, have, yeah, people that start off the beginning of the show, maybe that first skit, where they think they're playing along and you could you could dismiss them but because that takes the pressure off them a little bit they relax and then end up slipping into hypnosis and being an absolute star as well amen exactly because each time you put them back into hypnosis and then you you then do a demonstration they're becoming more receptive and less conscious they're getting yeah. more into that zone absolutely yeah. So true. So, um, but that was really good advice that, that Orman had given me. Now, the other thing is to have a safe stage. And that's yes. really important. I did an NGH convention years ago. Orman invited me to be his guest at an NGH convention. So I was doing a stage show and I did two lectures, translingual hypnosis and, uh, and I think, uh, uh neurofeedback. So, um, so I go there to do the sound check and I look and the stage wasn't safe. Now, this is this is a big convention. I'm not going to use names because I've already been been threatened by one of the guys that, you know, that was part of the organization back then when I was there, you know. Um, but the stage wasn't safe. The stage was very small and narrow. So if someone stands up and, and they do something creative or they dance, they could slip off the stage and there was no back to the stage. So mm -hmm. if their chairs go back enough, they're going to the chairs going to fall off the stage and they're going to fall backwards. So I tried to tell the guys, the good old boys, you know, I, to me, I, to them, I was just some young whippersnapper, you know. I tried to tell the good old boys that this stage isn't safe. And would you consider redesigning it, putting mm. some more platforms, making it a little bit wider and putting it against the wall? Don't tell us what to do, Tom. We know what we're doing. You know, <laughs> you just leave it to us. We know what, 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 we're, what we're doing. So, you know, they they totally didn't listen to me. So. Um, during the first show, some woman was doing the first stage show and this girl kept, you know, you know, you have the floppers, the people that just drop off the chairs. Someone called them a flopper. I kind of like that name. Yeah. Um, so well. she kept, she kept falling off the chair, 
and then get near the edge and, and her, have her body getting off the front of the stage and stuff like that. So um, it was my turn to do the show. And I was very aware of this. Now, my show is very, very physical. You know, I mean, I, I have them become Gangnam style dancers, river dancers, um, you know, just all kinds of stuff and uh, rock guitarists and, and, and yeah. drummers and all kinds of cool stuff. So anyway, that same girl jumped onto the stage to be in the show, and I didn't want her in the show because I thought she had a plan. I thought she was setting everybody up. She was setting mm. something up. I just didn't know what she was doing because it almost looked like what she was doing wasn't like a natural flopper, but a created yeah. flopper. So anyway, so she starts doing some weird stuff. So I do this bit that everyone's got a pet bird that they brought to, with them to the to the convention and they're going to talk to their bird and someone's got an ostrich on the string tugging and pulling and they got to hold on to this ostrich it was a bit i did for you know many years it worked great so i i i do it unfortunately i gave the girl the ostrich the the, the flopper so all of a sudden uh, i take him out of hypnosis i have all the birds chirping and stuff so all of a sudden she's holding the ostrich and she just runs as fast as she can all around the auditorium. Now I'm thinking, she's this is perfect. She's going to slip. She's going to fall. She's going to claim she injured herself. She's going to sue me. She's going to sue the NGH. She's going to sue everybody. So she finally made, uh, and, and I'm watching her, and I'm thinking, oh man, why didn't I get rid of her? I knew she was, you know, <laughs> dangerous for the shows. So um, she comes back onto the stage. She makes it on. She didn't, you know, fall. You know, goes back in hypnosis. Starts falling off the chair. I grab her. You know, you're stuck to your chair. You're glued to your chair. I bring her out of hypnosis. I put her back in the audience. So at the end of the night, I'm I'm over by the bar and she's drinking and she's trying to pick up on on guys and stuff and dancing and doing all this stuff. I get a call a week later. Now I get this call, and I'll say it. I get because this is the fact. I get a call from Jerry Valley and Dwight Damon, and they're saying we're in trouble, Tom. I go, well, what do you mean? The girl that was in your show, meaning my show, is suing us. She wants $30,000, and I don't know how much she wanted from me, thousands of dollars, because she, got, she claimed she got hurt in your show. I said, well, I said, she didn't get hurt in my show. I said, she was just, you know, as far as I'm concerned, I was watching her in, in both shows, and, and she was setting us up, guys. I said, she didn't get hurt. She was at the bar drinking and dancing, you know, but she claims she hurt her, her back or something like that, probably from falling off the chairs. So I said, I'm not going to, you know, don't include me in this lawsuit. I said, you know, my show was good and, and I released her because I think she was setting us all up. Yeah. So, so they get a little upset at me and then they call me next week, the same two guys and said, okay, she's decided now she doesn't want to sue us, but she wants a free training through the NGH. She wants to be able to go through the NGH course and get certified for free. That's not what she's asking for. The bottom line is she disappeared and no one ever heard from her again. Yeah. But I mean, when you see there could be somebody, this is what I look for when someone's way over the top and you'll yeah. agree with me on this. I, I would think you'll agree with me. If someone's way over the top, they could be actually, of course, fully conscious and fully aware and faking it. Because yeah. sometimes if somebody is way over the top, they could be dangerous to everyone else in the show. And maybe you should, you know, gently thank them for being up there, yep. take them out of hypnosis and put them back into the audience. Yeah. Has that ever happened to you, someone over the top in your show? Yeah. And, and weirdly, I, when, whenever people are over the top, I don't think audiences appreciate it. It, it makes it look too fake. Um, I like to see people struggle. I like to see them digest the suggestion um, and then them, them kind of the suggestion overwhelms them and then they perform it rather than, you know, you click your fingers, they're the world's greatest ballerina doing backflips and everything. It, it's kind of like rein that in a bit because it takes the spotlight from the other people that are on stage as well and they want to perform. But Robin says we don't do these lawsuit things in the Netherlands, Tom. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, 
Speaking of, uh, you mentioned then about the NGH training, uh, you've got some training coming up in uh, both your hometown of Oregon and in the Netherlands. Uh, can you tell us briefly about that? Oh, we've lost your sound, I believe, Tom. Um, let me let me just mute you and unmute you. See if that brings you back in. I've just put up links to those two trainings on the side there. Uh, let me just refresh the screen. See if that means we can get Tom back. Uh, one second. Okay, I'm back. Can you see me now? Can you see oh, me? Oh, yeah, we can see and hear you again now. We lost you for a second then. Okay, great. Well, yeah, I'm doing uh, two training courses. I've got two five-day courses coming up uh, starting September 20th in Holland. Um, they're being set up by my, my good friend Rob Camps, who, who is an amazing NLP uh, trainer and technologist out there. And so if there's anyone in Europe that wants to come to the, that course, it's a fantastic course. I'll be teaching uh, neurofeedback, EEG, brainwave frequency monitoring, various no. methodologies no. and techniques to produce low brainwave frequency states of receptive hypnosis. I'll be also teaching emotion replacement therapy, a technique that I use when I work with a lot of people with drug addiction or phobias or panic disorders or things like that. And I'll be teaching the art and science of online physical interactive therapy online uh, because I think that's really the wave of the future. And I'll be doing certifications in both of the courses, a lot of hands-on training. I'll have a fantastic training manual that's also going to cover medical science and hypnosis. I've been working closely with a lot of the medical doctors out here, and I'm working very diligently on getting us crossed over into the acceptance in the medical field. And more hospitals and doctors are embracing hypnosis, especially in Europe. And those of you in Holland, you already know that there are some medical technologists in, in Holland that are utilizing hypnosis, just as the Mayo brothers are using hypnosis. So um, I, I don't have any plans, Jason, to come to UK. It's been a long time since I taught there. My last courses were in, in Chester. I'd love to come back. Um, so if, if, if you want to organize one, I'd love to do it. I'm also teaching a course here in Medford, Oregon. But I teach you everything. I teach you what I've developed and what I know. I don't hold anything back. I don't do a course and then I take, get you to the next course and try to get more money out of you and then, then do the trainer's course and all that other BS. I teach you the methods. I give you the real deal. I'm there to, to work with you, to be your mentor afterwards for the rest of my life. I don't charge you for any of that other stuff, but that's the way it should be. You know, I was lucky that I had a guy like Orman McGill that, that embraced me and, and was, he was like my father. And he was also my mentor and my best friend. And, and that's how I want to be. That's how I want to live my life with integrity. The money is second. The most important is passing on what I've been working on developing and scientifically validating for 30-something years. That's the most important thing. I, wanna, uh, I just want to hope that hypnosis will move to the next level. But in order to do that, it has to be a higher academic scientific curriculum that is really based on neuroscience and how the brain and the organism called the mind can affect all the physiology within the body. I mean, so so it, it's brilliant and I love what I do. I'm passionate about what I do. But if you do come to the courses, uh, I will remain your friend for the rest of my life. Of course, you're going to probably live a lot longer than me and I'll <laughs> always be there for you just like Foreman was there for me. And I and I guarantee you, other other Sorry. trainers don't say that stuff. You know, the, the, I mean, there is a, a lot of movement of people that have kind of that that, that don't do; they just teach. Uh, but you definitely, yeah. you definitely do. So that's amazing, um, Tom. It's been an absolutely uh, phenomenal uh, talk. Um, thank you very much for for coming on and sharing your stories and some great tips as well for the for the stage guys that are watching. Um, 
I've put up links to the uh, to Oregon and the Netherlands in the comment section as well. So if you're interested in doing that, and the UK guys as well, the Netherlands is just it's 20 minutes away by a small plane, um, and so it's definitely worth you know getting in over there as well. Uh, and hopefully we'll try and get Tom over here soon as well. Well, I want to leave you with Natasha's statement. I really feel like we need a part two with Tom. Now, I, yeah. I'm not sure what that means. I'll leave that up yeah. to you. Um, but that would be brilliant because there's so much to talk about. Yeah. We just scratched the surface. But again, um, I'm going to leave you with just some tips. Be who you are. Embrace who you are. Have honesty. Um, have ethics in what you do. And have integrity. And I'm telling you, there, there's so much that we can do to entertain and educate and enlighten people about this amazing, amazing science that we call hypnosis. And um, yeah. I'm just yeah. proud to be on this. And, and if any of you want to, you know, be my friend and, and stay in touch with me, I, I'd be honored. So thank you very much. And thanks for having me on this, Graham. I really oh. appreciate it. Sir. Well, thank you very much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Guys, please do uh, uh, follow Tom on his social media as well, uh, to like and subscribe to this channel uh, so you can be kept up to date to any future shows as well. Guys, thank you very much. Yeah, uh, Robin says that the Netherlands is close to the UK and we have weed. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> and that, that's that, well, I'm not that, that's an interesting on that selling point for uh -huh. his course. But, but as you know, Robin, we does alter consciousness. Yes. So if you come to the course, we'll use an EEG on you while you're, while you're in, in, uh, indulging. And let's just see what brainwaves. And I would have to say the activity will lower and the brainwaves will lower. One last thing, folks, a little bit of neuroscience. Just by closing your eyes, your brainwave patterns will actually move instantly and automatically into an alpha state. 10 hertz. So eye closure, removing visual stimuli, will increase your auditory receptive states. And it already produces a wonderful state of hypnosis. All righty. Thanks so much, Graham. Fantastic. See you later, guys. See you later. Bye. Right. Uh, there we go. Absolute Tom Silver, an amazing interview. Guys, please do like and subscribe and click the bell. You kept up to date of these. And check out the playlist of other uh, stage hypnosis performers we've had on this show. It is a, a absolute database of knowledge. Uh, but Tom, I think we're definitely going to get back to the part two. He's been an absolute superstar. So, guys.